So good afternoon. I think uh, we should go ahead and start. Uh, it's a little over two o'clock. Um, I want to uh, thank the people who are here in person and also uh, people who are watching us uh, virtually. Um, and um, you can send in your questions. Uh, we are monitoring the virtual questions. And for the people in the audience, uh, please use the mic after uh, our wonderful speaker uh, is done with his, uh, with his talk. So it's my pleasure today to, to introduce uh, Dr. Eduardo Tarazon Santos. I hope I didn't kill that. Uh, who was, uh, this morning I learned that he was born in Peru and uh, although he's do doing most of his work now in, um, in Brazil. Yeah, he has a doctorate in both biochemistry and anthropology. And during his uh, postdoctoral training, he worked with uh, Dr. Sarah Tishkov, uh, which um, most of you who are track population genetics is one of the big time population geneticists at the University of Maryland um, and Dr. Uh, Stephen uh, Shannock at NCI. Currently, uh, he is a professor of human genetics at the Federal University of Minas Gerais. Again, you can see that when you come on stage, uh, so people actually get the right pronunciation. Uh, in Brazil, one of the leading academic institutions in Latin America. He's an expert in population genetics and the chief of the Laboratory of Human Genetic Diversity, uh, focusing on understanding the genetic diversity and genetic basis of complex traits and diseases in indigenous and admixed populations uh, from Latin America. He is the leader of genomic and bioinformatics analysis in the Epigene of Brazil the largest Latin America initiative in population genetics and genetic epidemiology, which has genotyped and sequenced approximately 7,000 Brazilians. Um, he's also the leader of the LC Brazil, a longitudinal study of aging, uh, including a Brazilian representative sample of close to 10,000 individuals. He's an active participant in international uh, network, uh, such as the uh, Ibero-American uh, Network of Pharmacogenetics. Uh, he has mentored more than 40 trainees in population genetics and bioinformatics. On a personal note, one of his mentees, Menteas Puiva, actually we would pronounce Puivaya, but let me just put it that way. He's now a research fellow in my lab uh, with outstanding skills in population genetics and genetic epidemiology that led to a successful K9 uh, applica in our application. Eduardo, we, are, we, are, we thank you for all you do to increase diversity uh, in genomic science. Please join me in welcoming him to give us a fantastic uh, talk about genetics and genomics in, uh, in South America. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Charles, for the presentation, uh, for, the introdu for introducing me. I am very honored to be here. I am very honored of giving this um, direct, uh, NHGRI uh, director seminar. And I thanks Charles and Mateus for inviting me for this uh, talk. I am very happy also to be here uh, again in the NIH where as I, Dr. Otimi said, I has, have been a postdoc several years ago. Okay, we will talk about um, the genomics uh, and population genetics of uh, both Native American and mixed populations of uh, Latin America. This is the topic of, of our research group in Brazil. And uh, so we will talk about ancestry and disease in Latin Amer uh, and genetics population of Latin American uh, uh, groups. I have a disclosure slide. I don't have conflict of interest to, to, to disclose. And we will start to talk uh, in general, something about ancestry. I know ancestry is a, a very, very complex and, and sometimes difficult concept to, to understand. But for we that live in Latin America or that uh, work on Hispanics, uh, it's very useful, it's very operational to be able to think in terms of continental or subcontinental ancestry. And we, 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 when we talk about that, we have several, uh, several options. We can talk about individual ancestry, which means that we can define 
uh, the proportions of, uh, in our case, African, Native American, or uh, European ancestry for each of us. We can talk about population ancestry when we talk about a specific group of a specific populations. But now we count since some years ago, we are able with enough data to uh, infer ancestry of each piece of chromosome, uh, of each piece of, of, of our chromosomes. This, that it uh, seems to be an exaggerated thing, an exaggerated concepts we will see is, is very, very helpful. One point important is this, uh, there is a lot of discussion about what ancestry means. We think in terms of uh, our history in Latin America, it's very relevant to think about continental ancestry. This, the, and this is because in terms of population genetics or also in terms of health, uh, the fact that Europeans and Africans started to arrive to our continent 500 years ago was a, a, very, a very important uh, event in our history and uh, is an event that have determined very important uh, components of our uh, health, but also of our social history. So uh, I think considering the African, European and Native American uh, proportion of our ancestry is, is very, very helpful, even if you also can think about which part of your uh, genome, for example, comes from Neanderthal or Denisovan. But I think in terms of our social history, it's not as much important as to think about what happened after the arrival of European Africans and uh, how they interacted with Native American in our uh, uh, continent. So I will talk about, uh, I will divide my presentation in two components. One is the uh, I will talk before, there are four, three concepts that we will talk about. One is ancestry, I said. Then uh, we will talk about Native American population genetics, how the environment, the genetic structure, and how uh, environment and genetic structure influence clinically actionable pharmacoalleles in Native Americans. And then we will talk about admixed populations in particular in Brazil. Uh, uh, there are two unifying concepts in, in my presentation that I think are, are very, very, very important in our research in, in South America, in Latin America. One is, and, and I will show uh, examples of this, and I am very happy to say that I am at the NHGRI uh, in a place where you actually uh, do a very, you have very, very, very big uh, fair North-South international collaborations. And then the other concept is that this uh, international and fair international collaborations has to uh, be uh, connected with training of human resources of young investigators also in, in, in Latin America. This is something we do uh, every day. And I think these two components are very, very important in any global initiative of uh, genomics. Okay, well, let's talk about how environment, how uh, uh, the history have influenced uh, the genetic structure of some Native American populations. Uh, you are, uh, you have in this cartoon uh, pictures, pictures of some Peruvian Native Americans. Uh, we, we were studying uh, as, together with Peruvian institution of the National Institute of Health from Peru, the genetics of uh, Native American groups in Peru. You can see there two very, very important biomas in Latin America, which are the Andean uh, mountains, which is a high altitude environment. This environment, this, this region that you see uh, there is a uh, it's, it's geographically, this is equivalent in terms of area to the Iberian Peninsula plus French plus Austria together. So this is a, 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 a big area. And there are two very, very important environments there. One is uh, the Andean mountains, uh, which is, with, with, is, is associated to a high altitude and to hypoxy environment. This is very dry environment. There are, uh, uh, and you have 
to at the east of these mountains, the uh, Amazon region, which is also a very, very relevant environment in South America. Okay, there are millions of people living in this environment. We studied the genomics of these people together with the Peruvian National Institute of Health and uh, together with the University of Maryland, uh, Tim O'Connor from the University of Maryland here in, in, in Baltimore. We have a, a very, very good experience doing this, this project. We studied something like 18 populations on, on more than 200 individuals. And one of the our findings, findings was uh, this. Okay, how is structured the, the, the genomics, the genomic diversity of these populations? And talking with local archeologists and people from, from, from Peru, we... Uh, um, it came out that we have two regions in Peru, a region that is called the uh, uh, Fertile Andean region, which is at the north in Peru, and uh, latitudinally a, a southern region, which is normally called the Arid Andean, which are more arid, but also are higher in terms of, of, of altitude. Okay, uh, and the interesting thing is that this uh, environmental division recapitulated in, in a certain way, the, the, the genomic structure of this population recapitulated these environmental differentiations between fertile Andean region in the north and arid Andean regions in, in, in the south. What you can see is, is this, okay, in the in the northern part of the Andeans, where Andeans are lower, there has been more gene flows between populations. And so the different populations living in the Andean area and the Amazonian area share a pattern of admixture. We can, we can see here green components of admixture, uh, which correspond to the ancestry, ancestry cluster, shared by uh, people living in the Andes, in the coast, and in the Amazonian region. But when you go to the south of the Andean region, and you have higher Andean uh, altitude, you can see the, that the genetic structure of these populations is, is very, very differentiated. You, we almost don't see here green components of ancestry. And in these populations who are living in, in the adjacent Amazonian region, you don't see a, a, an ancestry component, which is typical of the Andean uh, populations. So you have a north-south pattern of diversity, and in the southern and arid part and higher part of the Andean region, we have a, a very differentiated genetic structure between the Andes and the uh, Amazonian populations. So these have determined, for example, several interesting things. For example, the action of natural selections that have acted differentially in the Andean populations and in the Amazon populations. We have found very, very interesting signatures of selection. Okay, here we found uh, different uh, evidence of uh, natural selection and positive natural selection, adaptive natural selection, acting on genes, on particular genes in the Andean region, like Duox2, Duox2 which is an, a, a gene involved in innate immunity and also uh, in the thyro thyroid hormone synthesis, and HEN2 AS1, which participates in the regulation of development of cardiogenesis. And in the, in the, in the Amazon region, we have found very different signals of natural selection in genes like CD45 and TPRSS6, which is part of the hematological and iron metabolism function. In the case of CD45, this is a very important uh, molecule in host uh, viral interaction. Okay, so, but in addition to this, we published that a few years ago. This was a paper we published in 2020, more or less two, two, two years ago, led by, by Victor Borda, who, is, who was my PhD student from Peru, and now is in the University of, of, of Maryland. But then we were interested in looking for the distribution of clinically actionable variants in terms of pharmacogenetics. And we found two very, very interesting results that exemplifies how this uh, uh, projects about genomic diversity may be particularly important to find clinically relevant information. 
One example is this gene, which is, is this variant, which is involved, which is related with the uh, rosuvastatin uh, pharmacogenetics. This is a clinically actionable uh, genotype. And this is particularly relevant because uh, you can see that uh, this variant is, uh, par uh, uh, there is too, too much attention on the differentiation of this variant in East Asian populations. So there are different uh, regulatory agencies that make recommendations regarding that uh, East Asian populations that have a frequency of uh, around 30% of allele T should start the treatment with a lower dosage to uh, avoid uh, side effects. Okay, when we observe the comparing Andean populations with Amazonian populations, we figured out that the differences between Andean and Amazonian population are as larger as the difference between Asians and not Asian populations. So the, the, the size of the differences in allele frequencies were uh, as larger are the more prominent diverse diversification that this well known and this observer in East Asian uh, population. So even in a, in a region like Peru, we can observe in native population, big differences between in, in different uh, uh, geographic regions. This is another very important example. This is a, a variant that is very important in warfarin uh, uh, treatment. So in many populations, there are recommendations to genotype these variants to and to include this information in algorithms for dosage of warfarin. This is uh, relevant in low medium income countries. Why? Because in, 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 in high income countries, we can, you, can, you, you can substitute warfarin by other, by other drugs. But these drugs are among 10 times or 20 times more expensive than warfarin. So in low medium income, in, uh, income countries, this is not possible. So probably for, for many years, warfarin will be the drug to be used in the case of thrombosis. And it will be important to uh, perform pharmacogenetics testing of few SNPs, one, two SNPs, to adjust the, the dosage of warfarin. In this case, again, we are observing between Andean populations and Amazonian populations, differences that's, that are as higher as those observer between uh, that are well known in continental groups like East Asian respect to North East Asian populations. So these are two examples of how, and there is an additional problem in the Andean regions, is that we don't know, uh, there is no an algorithm for dosage of warfarin in the Andean regions, which would be important to develop because uh, there is a problem of high altitude and the altitude can influence the uh, metabolism of warfarin because the adaptation of Nandian populations to high altitude is mainly based on cardiovascular uh, uh, mechanisms. Okay, so these two examples uh, show uh, three things that of course, and maybe obviously genomic studies in neglected populations may reveal, may reveal clinically relevant information. Second, these examples uh, show the inadequacy of ignoring the internal genetic structure of ethnic groups such as Native American and this finding put challenge to concepts such as racial pharmacogenetics, or that maybe considers the, the, the groups, the continental groups as homogeneous. And this problem also shows how environment, environmental stresses on the cardiovascular system, such hypoxia in the Andes, posit new challenge for the understanding of the effect of genetic variation on drug response. Okay, so, I wanted to, to show this to regarding Native American populations. And now I would like to show our work on uh, admixed populations. These are my collaborators in the project of the Peruvian Genome Project, Heiner Guillo from the Peruvian National Institute of Health, Rob, Robert Gilman from Cayetano Heredia and Hopkins, and Tim O'Connor from the University of Maryland in, in, in Baltimore. And we are doing this and other stuff in the context of the Ibero-American uh, Network of Pharmacogenetics together with a very good Spaniard collaborator who is Adrián Yerena. So this is about Native American populations, but in addition to indigenous populations, uh, uh, 
in South America. Uh, I know we are in the month of Native American heritage. We have also admixed populations in, in, in different across Latin America, as you have here, the US Hispanic people who are the, the descendants of Latin American people. Okay, we have been working on a while for uh, with uh, admixture and disease in Brazilian populations. We uh, were working for several years in the project of Epigen Brazil. This was a, a very big initiative of the Brazilian Ministry of Health, in particular of the Department of Science and Technology of the Brazilian Ministry of Health. Um, this, this, uh, the, the Brazilian Ministry of Health funded the genotyping of around 6,000 individuals. And at, at that time, that was a larger uh, uh, genomic initiative in Latin America. This is part of a, of a network that involved people from several institutions in Brazil. And now we are moving to the genomics of uh, the Brazilian uh, aging longitudinal, longitudinal study. Okay, and we, I want to show you some results regarding these projects and the work uh, of our groups uh, during the last uh, few years. These were the three population-based Brazilian cohorts that were genotyped and some individuals were uh, world genome sequenced. Uh, one Brazilian cohort from Northeastern Brazil, which is very, very, uh, uh, which is more African than the other cohorts. One cohort of age, an aging cohort in Southeast Brazil and one cohort in the South of, of Brazil. These are the three most populated uh, Brazilian regions. We were focused particularly in the African parts of the, of the Brazilian genomes. And we were focused on that because we know uh, African and, and Native American uh, are uh, our parts of, of, of our genome that were of African or Native American origins where are, uh, uh, have not as much, there is not as much research on those region, on those genomic regions respect to European information from uh, the European part of our genomes. So we have some questions regarding the population genetics of these groups. Uh, for example, we were looking at in a we were looking at in a in a project that was led by my Mateos. Okay, if there was a correspondence between the geographic origin of a specific African population of the diaspora and a specific destination in the Americas, we created a data set with different populations in Latin America and also African American populations. And we look at for subcontinental ancestry in uh, different African and Latin American populations. And as we already know, the West Central African Associated Cluster is the most relevant, is the most prevalent in most admitted American continent populations. And we saw also that there is a Western Africa ancestry, which is not almost no present, is absent, almost absent in South of South America, okay? Uh, the Western Africa Associated Cluster is more prevalent in Northern latitudes of the America and ha has a very low prevalence in Southern South America. Then we have a component of Southeast Africa, which is associated with Bantu population that shows the highest proportion in, in South and Southeastern Brazil. Okay, and we were interested in trying to figure out which are the historical and, and the geographical factors that influence this structure of African uh, uh, diversity in the Americas. One factor was latitudinal proximity, probably. Okay, another factor were the ocean currents and winds of that divided, that created two systems of navigation in North and South Atlantic. And it was related also probably with geopolitical factors because the control of North Atlantic route was uh, in the hands of British people who abolished slavery in 1870. And because on the other side, Portugal influence in Angola, Mozambique and Tanzania and, and Portugal, uh, Portugal ship, ships, brought uh, 
uh, people to the South America, to the Brazil in particular, and because Portuguese uses Southern Atlantic roads to bring slaves to uh, Brazil in particular to Rio de Janeiro. Okay, so our first conclusion about this question was that both geography and geopolitics influenced the geography and linguistic diversity of Africa, African migrants, as well as favored the regional differentiation of African ancestry in the uh, uh, Americans. Uh, okay, now, then we have another question. Our second question was this. Considering the geographic extension and the massive demographic magnitude of the African diaspora and the level of population differentiation between populations in, in different African regions, did the transatlantic slave trade lead to a very similar level of structure of between population differentiation in, in the Americas? So we are looking only to the African portion of Latin American genomes, okay? And what was the, the answer to, to this? We were worried about this because you can see here that Afri African, African cluster of the genomes, you hear him in, in, in blue, in, in, in yellow, or in purple, are more structured and more geographically differentiated than in the Americas. In the Americas, they look more uh, homogeneous. When we did a formal test for, for this, we saw, you can see here, that the FST, which is a measurement of between population differentiation, is lower in the Americas. This is the distribution for SNPs in the America, was lower than in Africans. What does it mean? This means that the African diaspora, after the, the African diaspora, we observe an homogenization of the between population component of genetic variation associated with the African diaspora, which is, was probably the product of admixture between individuals in the, in the Americas. There were some historical facts that might have contributed to this. So despite their specific European origins, traders, vessels, tra transporter slaves frequently illegally to different American ports. There was also a, a process called forced amalgamation, which is the, the, the preference, which was the preference of slave owners for slaves from different geographic and linguistic origins uh, to avoid that each they understand each other. And it was also very important the role of islands such as Jamaica and Barbados that centralized parts of our evil of America, of African people, and then redistributed these people in different parts of the of, of the of the continent. So uh, the population genetics is able to trace the African roots of admixed individuals of the Americans to a broad geographic extension that goes from Western Africa to East Africa, associated with a high linguistic diversity from niger cordofanian regions to Western and Eastern Bantu uh, regions. And uh, historical facts homogenized the between population components of genetic diversity, uh, and these forces have predominated over that evolutionary forces that have differentiated the genetic diversity of, of our African portion of our uh, 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 genomes. So we were talking about admixture mapping, which is a technique that allow us to use admixture to find variants that may, may be responsible that may influence complex trait, in this case, uh, BMI or uh, obesity. Okay, so we were, we developed, we, we performed an admixture mapping uh, looking for European associated or Native American associated fragments of the genome that may be associated with uh, BMI or obesity in Brazilian, uh, uh, in our Brazilian cohorts. We studied three Brazilian cohorts, three admixed Brazilian cohorts with different distributions of BMI. We didn't uh, put all the individuals together because the, the age uh, uh, distribution was, was very, very different. And so this is what we found, okay? When we specifically uh, studied, we, we found an association only for women. This is very, very important. So we found uh, for women from Southern Brazil, 
from Pelotas uh, cohort in Brazil, we have we, we found a specific region of chromosome 13 that were more likely African in obese uh, women. So that means that that region in chromosome 13 should contain a genetic variant of African origin that predisposed to uh, uh, obesity. This was very, very important because this cohort, these women had only 15% of uh, African ancestry. So this means that even if you study in Latin America, uh, uh, a white population, okay, it's very, very likely that these white people that self-classify as white for sure will have a, a fragments of their genome that have a African origin, okay? And in particular in South of Brazil, they can have a, a African segments that may come from, for example, regions, uh, 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 from South Africa that are more common in Southern Brazil respect to the Caribbean or the North uh, America. Okay, so the first signal we have was an, an association with, a negative association for chromosome 13 with European, European uh, pieces of DNA. When we look at that, it came out that these pieces were predominantly Africans because these populations were uh, mostly admixed of uh, Europeans and, and Africans. This only happened in, in, in women, uh, okay? When we performed a fine mapping, we look at, we identified a specific uh, variant, which is this one in this region that was associated with uh, uh, obesity, which was strongly associated with obesity, with BMI in, uh, in, in admixed women of Southern Brazil, okay? But then we said, okay, but this is too much. This is too strong association. It's four units of BMI for each allele. And we didn't believe in that. So, and there was a problem because uh, uh, we, uh, this was an imputed variant. So even if we observed a strong association, we were not so convinced. So we uh, tested the association only uh, in adult women from Bambui, from a different cohort, and we replicated the association, okay? But okay, but this was, again, an imputed variant. So we looked for uh, world sequence data, world genome sequence data for actually for uh, uh, genotyped data, because it, it may have, this may have been an artifact of imputation. And we, when we, studied the association in a, a third cohort in Sao Paulo, we replicated the association even with a, a smaller effect, okay? So we were able to find a, a, a variant that was of African origins in white people in admixed women, okay, that is associated with obesity. And we try to replicate that finding in different, in different populations. In, in Puerto Rico, we didn't find association. In Africa, we didn't observe that association with, with that. We did that with people working with the H3 uh, initiative. Uh, we collaborated also with Sarah Dishkov. We, we didn't observe that association. So this seems to be a variant, which is which has an African origin, but seems to have an effect specifically in women and specifically in admitted uh, uh, women. Okay, and we replicated that, we replicated that finding in three uh, uh, Brazilian cohorts, one of them uh, including world genome sequencing data. So when we performed a meta-analysis, we found that uh, uh, the association was uh, was uh, uh, present, okay? Not in all the populations, we allow it for heterogeneity, but we observed by that this variant seems to contribute to an average of one unit of BMI for each allele, which even is not our original finding of three units of BMI. This is a, a very relevant uh, uh, variant, seems to be a very, very relevant variant when, they think, when we think about the effects of variants that are contributing to obesity. So this is an example of variants of how admixed populations may be used 
to find uh, uh, variants of African or Native American origins uh, uh, that contribute to uh, complex disease studying uh, Latin American admixed populations are using a family of association studies such as admixture mapping or other techniques that are uh, currently used like the tractor or uh, uh, even considering local ancestry as uh, covariates uh, and considering including the concept of local chromosome uh, ancestry. Okay, we published this in one year ago. Uh, and finally, okay, we were we are particularly interested in, in terms of population genetics in not only to take pictures, present pictures of that mixture, but also in uh, inferring the dynamics of the process in, in the Americas. Okay, so uh, uh, the, the current methods, the most uh, uh, recent methods in population genetics try not only to, to, to have a picture, uh, very uh, high resolution pictures of admixture, but we want to be able to tell how this process occurred a long time. So we were using a concept who was the fact that when you had admixture, the tracks which are pieces of chromosomes from different origin, when you had a mixture, populations tend to have more tracts, more fragments of different origins, and these fragments tend to be shorter and shorter and shorter. More admixture you have this process, and we are developing this, this idea, we are capitalizing on this idea, to develop a method based on uh, uh, ABC, approximate Bayesian com computation, to infer the dynamics of the process of admixture. What does it mean? It means to be able to infer the uh, contribution of African, European, and Native American a long time, for example, for each century, or even a continuous function of admixture uh, along the last five uh, uh, centuries. For example, what was uh, when, when we use this concept of increasing numbers and smaller numbers of uh, uh, chromosome segments of different ancestry, and we applied this method in 2015 to Brazilian populations, we found a very, very interesting result, okay, focused on Native Americans. When would you look at the size distribution of pieces? In Brazil, of Native American ancestry, you see these pieces of, of uh, Native American origins are relatively small, are very small. Okay, and when you estimate with, you, you, with our method the contribution uh, a long time, you see this: 500 uh, uh, years ago, the contribution of Native American, uh, uh, the Native American contribution were were about in different Brazilian populations more than 20%. Okay. After that, the contribution decreases sharply. And why this happened? This happened because the Native Americans of Brazil were uh, actually uh, 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 decimated. Okay. The small Native American contribution was concentrated in the first pulse of admixture immediately after the arrival of European. And this is the genomic signature of a population decimation in, in, in Brazil. Okay, so genomics can be also used, and this is very important in, in, in today, where sometimes genomics are 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 uh, used or might be used wrongly to uh, 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 justify. In some instance, there is a very interesting papers in Nature a, a few weeks ago racist behaviors, genomics can be also used to infer our history, to infer social aspects of our history. And in, in our case, for example, Brazilian who have a very low level of Native American admixture have the uh, signature in their genomes of the process of decimation of Native American uh, populations. We are interested in particularly in a process that is called the dynamics of sexual ancestry bias. This means that in Latin America, you frequently say 
that in this is related with our social history with the uh, process of power of European with the use of power of Europeans, African and Native Americans. For this reason it's well known that uh, when you look at that mixture in autosomal chromosome and the X chromosome, frequently the uh, European admixture are higher in the autosomal and the African and Native American admixture is more uh, uh, is higher in the X chromosome. This is because admixture has been mediated, Afri European admixture has been mediated by males predominantly and African and Native American admixture have been mediated by women predominantly. Okay, there was a, a correlation. This is what, what is called a, a sexual ancestry bias, bias technically. So we are developing methods to infer the dynamics of this process, not only to infer the dynamics of admixture, but only to infer the dynamics of this sex ancestry uh, bias. Okay, Th these are some results, for example, for Salvador. For Salvador, we have, uh, which is a, a, a the most African portion of, of Brazil, we have evidence in, in our genomes of a preferential uh, admixture between female Native Americans and males Africans. Okay, and we, we look for the, the dynamics of that process. Okay, we look that after the 16th century, we have a, a, an increase in the uh, uh, in the in the marriage between European males and uh, African females. Then we have the, the, this process was uh, uh, stabilized, stabilized, and then it increased again uh, uh, in the uh, 19th, 20th centuries. Okay, so we are developing methods to infer this, this kind of process, which are part of our social history and our history of uh, relationship of power between uh, African Europeans and Native Americans. So this is one of the reasons, because I think uh, for us in Latin America, when we talk about ancestry, to talk about European, African, and Native American, uh, uh, ancestry is much more important than uh, considering ancestry just as such an abstract concept because uh, most of our history has been dominated by uh, the interaction between African, Europeans, and uh, Native Americans. So uh, I, I just wanted to show you some of our work, how uh, population genetics as ancestry concepts May, uh, we, have, we, are, we have used these concepts not only to find uh, genetic variants that influence uh, a complex traits like uh, BMI or obesity, but also to infer uh, import, to how important aspects of our social history and how the environmental diversity in the case of Native Americans of uh, the Andean and Amazonian region can contribute to uh, influence the uh, distribution even of clinically relevant variants like we saw in the examples of uh, rosuvastatin pharmacoalils and warfarin pharmacoalils. Uh, I want to thank my research group. Uh, uh, Mateus was part of, of uh, that and, and was part of uh, part of this analysis I show. I want to, to thank our Brazilian funding uh, agencies, in particularly the program Genomas Brazil from Geno Genomas Brazil from the Brazilian Ministry of Health. Uh, and thank you very much for our presence. And uh, I would like to be able to answer your question if you have them. Thanks. Okay, while we're waiting for while we're waiting for some of the, the live ones, we can do some of the online questions. This first one I think came in during your discussion of BMI, and it's asking what was the signal on chromosome 20? <laughs> the signal of I, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um 
Yeah, the, the, in the paper, there are other signals that um, some of them are, are reproduced. We, we reproduced several of the, of the signals well known to be associated with, uh, with uh, DMI. Uh, other signals, uh, I don't remember exactly the, 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 the signal on chromosome 20, okay? <laughs> but uh, if the, the person who asked emailed me, I, I, I can send the information. I learned a lot of history just listening to your talk. Uh, that was quite uh, revealing. Uh, is, you can hear me? Oh, towards me? Okay, I thought I have a, a loud mouth, so I just... Yeah. But anyway, I, just, I was just curious that all through your talk, you didn't say anything about Asian admixture or ancestry in Brazil. And I was just curious, is there any documentation of that? Uh, you spoke about Native American, African, and European, but nothing about Asian. I was just curious whether that's part of the history there. Yeah, uh, we found in our cohorts, we uh, had only one individual which was 50% Asian and 50% European. So because we had only that signal uh, and we, did, we didn't have uh, uh, evidence of, of, at least in the, the Brazilian cohorts we were studying, we didn't focus on that. But of course, that's the... the um, the Asian contribution is relevant. For example, probably uh, Sao Paulo is one of the largest Japanese uh, uh, city in the world, okay? Uh, we, for example, in Peru, we also have a very, very relevant uh, Chinese community. We have a Chinatown in Lima also, for example. And, but we didn't, uh, but because we didn't have a, a, a signature of Asian, of an Asian component in our cohorts, we decided not to include them in the, in the but that would be terrific to, to figure out not only the contribution uh, when, when we, we will work at more, a higher resolution of, of uh, Chinese uh, uh, immigration in, in, in in Western South America or Japanese immigration in Brazil, but also, for example, Middle Eastern contribution to different parts of, of, of uh, Latin America. Both uh, Jewish population are also uh, uh, Arab components that may be present in, in different parts of the continent. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for that fantastic talk. Uh, this is Debo Ademo from uh, NHGRI. Uh, I have a two-part question. Uh, the first one is, how good are the reference imputation panels like Thousand Genomes and TopMed uh, for the Brazilian populations that you study when you do imputation for GWAS studies? Mm -hmm. uh, the second part is more related to that, which is, are you planning to do whole genome sequencing? Um, in case there are variants that are not currently known that you may discover in these populations? Thank you. Yeah, uh, which <clears throat> we developed it and, and uh, uh, we recently were testing a Brazilian imputation panel that included a Brazilian cohort of 1000 individuals called SABE that was sequenced by a Sao Paulo group from Professor Mayana Sad and Michel Navlaski. So we were testing the imputation with that. We are assessing how good is uh, the imputation with the top met panel and the Brazilian plus 1000 genome panel. And in particularly, if we can do something like meta imputation, which is a concept I, I learned in the ASAEG meeting last, last um, week, or maybe to put together the uh, Sao Paulo cohort, which is all across Brazil from uh, Michel Navlaski and, and Mayana Sats groups uh, uh, with, author, with other panels. Okay, so we are working. Actually, we have a very good imputation pipelines in our group. And so we are working with them to, to do the testing, to, to figure out how is the best way to, to, to do imputation for Brazilian data. Uh, there are some uh, World Genome Sequences initiatives in, in Brazil. When we work on that in 2012, 13, we only sequenced 30 individuals. Then 
uh, the larger set of Brazilian individuals that have been sequenced and have been published with our contribution in the analysis last year. This is these are one around one twelve hundred individuals from a cohort called Sabe. Uh, we have been very very happy of be part of this. This is from uh, Michel Naflaski and Mayana Sats group, and uh, then. That should be uh, coming out new data. There are something like two, three thousand Brazilians that are being uh, uh, sequenced by a very good Brazilian population scientists like uh, Ligia Pereira and, and Alessandra Pereira and uh, Tabitha Hunemeyer. They should publish in, in some months. And there is a very interesting initiative of the Brazilian Ministry of Health to uh, do whole genome sequences of Brazilian cohorts. And so we hope to be able to sequence, for example, the LC or the EPGEN cohorts to generate uh, uh, NGS data for, for, for them. So some more online questions, uh, anonymous one. Are the Europeans that colonized Brazil of Jewish an ancestry? Sorry? Uh, are the Europeans that colonized Brazil of Jewish ancestry, or is there a significant? Um, I know there is a, a publication, we, di we didn't work on that, but there is a publication a few years ago from the Andre Ruiz Linares group that showed a very interesting thing. That was that uh, people, that the Iberian ancestry in Brazil, okay, came from people that at that time, at the time of the of the of the colonization, so something like five uh, centuries ago, they were called New Christians in the Iberian Peninsula, and these were probably Jews that converted to the to the Christian religion because uh, it was better to be a Christian in the Iberian Peninsula, and they migrated to the to the to the Americas. And uh, Andres Ruiz Rinares groups a few years ago found the signature of this, the genomic signature of this migration of people with uh, Jews origin who are called conversos to, to the Americas. Fascinated by the history of Brazil and South America in general. Um, I was just curious, you've shown some very interesting historic things that genomics is revealing. I wonder how do you how do you interpret this for the general population to appreciate? I, you know, I'm just curious. Like when I was in Brazil, you can fit the whole skin color you see in the world. You can see it in the streets of Rio. So I'm just curious, how is this social communication of your genomic findings? Yeah, we have some activities for uh, spread this 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 knowledge. We have some activities in in the social network. In in, in uh, we were uh, thinking about that. So I think there are two uh, levels of, of of knowledge. One is the implication of this knowledge in in health. Okay, so is is is. Uh, very important, for example, to communicate that this kind of studies, like we showed in the case of Native American, can produce relevant knowledge, but may be very helpful, for example, to in pharmacogenetics. In pharmacogenetics, there are very good examples. One is the the rosuvastatin example. One is the var varfarin example. Okay, and maybe uh, to show that even in to show the idea, I didn't show a slide that I have that uh, even Native American, so besides the admixture between European, but even if we consider Native American, they are a very diverse group. This is a very important concept because um, there is an aphorism by uh, Antonio de Ulloa, who was a traveler, a Spaniard traveling of centuries. 17, I think, who wrote a very famous statement, who is, if you saw one American uh, Indian, you have saw 
all the American Indians, something like this. Okay, and I think people for maybe now is more aware, for example, about the African diversity. And this is very, very good because Africa is a very diverse country. Um, and uh, even if you could, but I am not sure this is also true in the case of Native Americans. Okay, and this is even important, even more important for uh, United States European investigators. This is very important because, for example, when you, when you think about Alex Herdlicka, Alex Herdlicka was a very prominent Czech American, one of the fathers of American anthropology uh, and, and one of the fathers of Native American anthropology. Native Alex Herdlicka is a father of, of uh, biological anthropology and have a statement at the beginning of the last century, so in the 20th century, okay, that were very, very similar to Antonio Duyo's statements about the fact that uh, uh, all Native Americans are, are very, very similar, okay? So I think this, I think this is a very, very important message to, to transmit, okay? That uh, not all Native Americans are even genetically, of course, uh, th there is, a, 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 there is a, a, a big diversity between Native Americans. This is very important because sometimes, obviously, that's, that's better, better than nothing, but we, we do uh, big projects dividing the people in Native American components, Native Americans, the, 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 the Peruvians from Lima are the representative of American people in the 1000 Genome Project, okay? But we need to be aware that that's not enough, okay? And that was uh, a lot of diversity related with environment, with culture, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, the other thing I think is that, uh, and this is a very important concept in Brazil, for example, and this is, I am Peruvian, okay? And, and Peruvian is, uh, in Peru and Mexico, archeology span is very, very important for our identity. So, because we have built cultures uh, very important cultures before the European arrival. In Brazil, history, historical knowledge derived from human population genetics about the history of Brazilian admixture is as much important as is um, archaeology, for example, in Peru or in Mexico. This is something a, a, a person, Ricardo Ventura from the Rio de Janeiro National Museum uh, uh, told me he has worked a lot on the history of Brazilian genetics. Uh, and, and this is so. These studies are also very, very important to learn about uh, our history, our social history, and our social history of racism in Latin America because population genetics how can show us a, a very important parts of our of the african part of the brazilian history of the native american part of the brazilian history this is one something we stress it because for example uh, when uh, brazil uh, the, this is something what is called in Brazil the lay the the Aurea rule. It was the um, the when when the when the slavery was uh, uh, abolished in in Brazil, they burned out all the registers about uh, uh, slaves. Okay, uh, and was this means that part of Brazilian history has been lost. Okay, and I think population genetics can, in some instance, contribute to learn about uh, our history in, in, in Latin America. And, uh, and this is also a very important component of our research. In addition, of course, to contributing to, to, to health, which is something we are particularly interested in and is our prim primary interest. So the, the questions keep rolling in. Unfortunately, I don't think we can uh, get to all of them because there's uh it's eight, still eight of them here but uh, maybe, maybe one more and then we'll we'll uh, say sorry to everyone else so from elizabeth atkinson very cool work i was very interested in your association finding in the african tracts of admixed latin american populations that was not seen in populations from the african content 
Was this due to a higher MAF in the admixed populations? If so, do you think this is because of drift or selection? Uh, we don't know. Okay, we we that that's a very very interesting point. We we try it to uh, we publish it all the results of our replication attempts. So the, those that gave positive association and those that that did not. So for example, we didn't see association in in, in two African cohorts. One was the H three African data from South uh, Africa. Uh, and also in this was a urban environment. I think it was Johannesburg or and there was also data from rural areas from Saratishko group and we didn't see uh, any sort even even uh, uh, not we didn't see any signal. okay So we, we but we are very, very. We were very interested that we were able to to to, to replicate in three different Brazilian cohorts. Okay, and Brazilian is a big country, so <laughs> it wasn't the, the, the same population. So it's, it's also intriguing for us. Uh, yeah, I think we have to call it quits. But maybe one more round of applause. Thank you for Dr. Tarantino. Thank you very much.